everyone my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am I post videos pertaining to a little bit of whatever I want conspiracy theories controversial people true crime vlogs a little bit of everything so if you're interested in any of that you can subscribe and if not totally chill you don't have to subscribe to be in the click you know you if you just want to vibe and go vibe and go but today we're just going to be doing a little bit of makeup talking a little bit of true crime and today we are going to be talking about the case of lauren smith fields now there is a lot to get through so we are just going to hop right into it before getting into the rest of today's video i do want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's episode babel now if you guys don't know what babel is babel is your new language learning best friend that offers tons of different languages for you to to learn like Spanish, Danish, French, Polish. Lessons are super quick like 10 minutes long and can have you learning the new language in as little as three weeks. Now as you guys may or may not know I listen to a lot of French music recently. I've been really loving French music when I'm like getting ready in the morning because it's just you know such a slow vibe but unfortunately since I don't speak French I don't really know what they're saying although it sounds beautiful and so with Bab I was actually able to learn some French, like Je m'appelle Haley. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Send me off to France. Not a lot, but that's okay because, you know, that's what Babbel is for. One big issue for me I found when it came to language learning apps is that a lot of them made you speak like you were a Siri robot. And, like, I just feel like sometimes the languages that are being taught are taught too formal. And so when you actually use them in the real world, people are looking at you like, why are you speaking like a politician right now? Like, this is just a casual conversation. But with Babbel, Babel, all of their lessons are actually taught by actual language teachers and so you don't have to worry about any of that what you're using is things that you're actually going to be using in a normal conversation Babel also helps you out no matter what your learning preferences is so if you are a more auditory listener they have podcasts they have games for more hands-on as well as live classes if you're more visual Babel also has a 20-day money-back guarantee and so there's literally no risk in just trying it out. So whether you're studying abroad or dreaming of a future travel or just have the itch to learn something new, Babbel is the perfect place to start. And Babbel currently is giving every single one of you guys 60% off your Babbel subscription by clicking my link down below. And again, thank you so, so much to Babbel for sponsoring today's episode. Now back to your video. Lauren Smith Fields was born on January 28th, 1998 in Bridgeport, Connecticut to her mom Chantel and her father Everett. She also grew up with her three siblings Kyle, Tavar, and Lakeem. Lauren attended Stamford High School and from her classmates and friends Lauren was described to be a very funny and outgoing person. Lauren was also the type of person that was very motivated, very dedicated to her work. She was definitely the type of girl that like if she wanted something she was gonna go for it. And so because of this, she got really good grades in high school. She also kept in really good shape. She was on a like plant-based slash vegan diet and she also ran for her school track team. So she was keeping herself super healthy. She was basically that girl. Like she kept herself healthy. She ate vegan. She worked out. She also had really good friends because as I said, she was super funny and outgoing, but she was also very dedicated and focused on her studies. Like, like, is there anything this girl can't do? Although she was a very busy bee, that did not mean that she would not find time to spend with her family. She was also a very big family girl, you know, family first before everything. And so even though Lauren was super busy with her day-to-day -day life, she always made sure to make time for her family, especially her mother, Chantel. Her and her mother, Chantel, were like best friends. My daughter was um funny she was like when she walks into a room she lit up the whole room always being there for me like going out and having mother and daughter um dates getting our nails done yeah. um and just and just also just spending time together with each other her cooking for me because i work so late at night sometimes she just come over and be like mom let me just grab your laundry 
blossom for you. Aww. She was that type of daughter. After high school, that is when she attended Norwalk College to become a physical therapist. And during this time is also when she started to kind of pick up on a few side hustles. She had started a YouTube channel. On her YouTube channel, she would post things like DIYs, story times, wig installation, and fashion videos. And even from her videos alone, you can really get a sense of like Lauren's personality. And even her brother Tavar would go on to say that Lauren was just the type of person that always had good energy around her. So it's like, even if you didn't really know Lauren or if you weren't even really talking to her, just being in her presence just made you feel so good. Hakeem also said the same thing. He said that he loved Lauren so, so much and she was the best sister he could have ever asked for. Although Lauren, you know, she would think that she would be swamped with college and also just taking care of herself by working out, but then also, you know, making time for her family, you would think that she would get extremely busy, but Lauren also prioritized self-care and she would travel all the time. She's been to places like London, Rome, Jamaica, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, the DR, like even just like seeing that is kind of inspirational because it just shows you that like even though she was so hardworking and focused, she balanced out her life perfectly so that she could still be able to enjoy her life while working hard for the life that she lives. As I said, it was just her good energy all the time that really took her to extraordinary places. Lauren just seemed to be like everyone's favorite person to be around. And then on December 13th of 2021, that is when the family was actually planning on having like a small Christmas party. But Lauren actually just got a place of her own recently at this point. Like she was living all by herself. So since she had this new place, she wanted to host a Christmas party at her house. And so on the day of December 13th, that is when Lauren's mother, Chantel, had called Lauren just to, you know, talk about the Christmas party. What are we cooking? What time are we meeting? When Chantel tried to call Lauren, Lauren did not pick up. And so at first, Chantel didn't really think about it. She was just like, oh, maybe Lauren is busy. Maybe she's not by her phone. But it grew later and later and Lauren did not contact her mother back. And so that is when her mom had texted her saying, quote, are you okay? Please let me know. And hours and hours continued to go by and there was no answer from Lauren. And this was very, very out of character for Lauren because as I said, her and her mother Chantel were like best friends. And so even if Lauren was super busy, she always found time to reply to her mom or talk to her mom. And so when it got to be around 9 p.m. that night, that's when Chantel really knew something was wrong. Chantel and Lauren's brother Lakeem decided to go over to Lauren's apartment to just see if everything was okay but when they got there there was a note on the door that said quote if you're looking for Lauren, call this number. And there was a number attached at the bottom. And so when uh, Chantel had called that number, it was actually the number to the landlord. And the landlord said, oh, if you're looking for Lauren, like just stay right there. I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna talk to you guys in person. And that is when unfortunately the landlord had to give the news to Chantel and Lakeem that the morning before on December 12th at around 6.49 a.m., the police had showed up up to Lauren's apartment to find Lauren lying dead in her bed. And the police could tell by looking at Lauren's body that when she was found at 649, it was speculated that she was dead for at least an hour before the police arrived. And this was clearly very shocking, very traumatizing to Chantel and Lakeem. Not just the fact that, you know, Lauren is dead. Words can't even describe the feelings that they were probably feeling, but the fact that they had to learn this information from a landlord instead of an actual police officer. And it's not like they were the ones that reached out to Lauren's family. Lauren's family had to go out of their way to try to find Lauren and that's how they were given the news. Nobody came to them, nobody said anything to them. So this was all just so unbelievable and confusing. And if Lauren was, you know, declared as dead on the scene, it's typical proto 
protocol that you would first contact the family of that victim, not just, you know, like the police, but also the hospital because someone needs to come into the coroner's office for that body and clarify that that is the body of Lauren. But in this situation, no one did any of that. They knew like Lauren's name. They found her ID. They found her driver's license. They found everything in the apartment, yet nobody thought to contact the family immediately after. The family also noted that her apartment literally looked like as if nothing went on there. There was no caution tape. There was no police officer searching the place. And so the landlord had told Chantel and Lakeem that unfortunately he doesn't really know much about what happened to Lauren, but if they are looking for more information to contact this one specific detective by the name of Kevin Cronin. Apparently Kevin Cronin was like the lead on this case. And so the landlord was like, I don't know any information because they wouldn't tell me anything, but definitely Kevin knows some things. And so immediately afterwards, Chantel and Lakeem contacted Kevin. Kevin gave them some information, but not all of the information that they were looking for. Kevin had told Chantel and Lakeem that Lauren had been on a Bumble date on the night of December 11th with 37-year-old Matthew LaFountain. Matthew LaFountain ended up spending the night from December 11th to December 12th, and when he woke up at around 6.30 in the morning, that is when he rolled over and found Lauren lying unresponsive on the bed with blood coming out of her nose. So immediately when Matthew saw this, that is when he called the police, the police showed up, and that's when they declared Lauren dead on the scene. Matthew was the last person to see Lauren alive, so you would think that this would be the first person that they look to for answers, yet Matthew at this point was never called into questioning. And when Chantel and Lakeem had asked him this of like, why aren't you interrogating him a little bit more? Kevin replied with quote, don't worry, he's a nice guy. AKA Matthew definitely had some connections with the police and was able to get off with no questioning. Well, obviously with this new guy, you know, entering into the story, it just makes things 10 times more confusing of like, well, where is this guy now? Did you just let him go? How much information does he have? What exactly did he see? How was Lauren the night before? Like there was just so many unanswered questions. I mean, deservingly so. Chantel and and Lakeem tell Kevin like, hey, this would be a lot better if we could just speak about it in person. Can you come down to Lauren's apartment right now just so we could discuss all of this in person? And Kevin agreed. He said, yeah, I'll be down to Lauren's apartment in a little bit. Chantel and Lakeem basically just sit there in shock. They're scared. They're confused. They're frustrated. And also they're scared for Lauren because at this point they have no clue where Lauren's body is. As I said, no hospitals contacted them, no coroner's office contacted them, even though they knew that Lauren was dead. No police officers had contacted them. Like, they don't even know where Lauren's body is to give her a proper burial. A half hour goes by, which probably feels like three hours, and Kevin has not showed up yet. So that is when Chantel calls back to, you know, see where Kevin is. Is he almost there? And so she calls him once, but it goes straight to voicemail. She calls him a second time and it goes straight to voicemail. She calls him a third time and he finally picks up. And when he does, he just says, quote, stop calling me and just hangs up on them. And frustrating enough, unfortunately, this wouldn't be the last time that the family was hung up on by the police. Chantel even said, quote, he told me directly on the phone to stop calling him and hung up in my face. It was just like total disrespect. Like that's what you tell a family that's going through grief and trying to find answers. The way they talk to me, the way they talk to the family, how they treated my daughter, they treated her like she was a nobody, that she was not important. Not only did the police hang up on Lauren's family, the police continued to ignore Lauren's family for 16 
16 days. 16 days go by, Christmas goes by, and no answers from anyone. And the family is trying everything. They're trying to contact the police, they're trying to contact detectives, trying to find answers about where Lauren was, how she even passed away in the first place, like her cause of death, and also who this mystery Matthew LaFountain was, that even though he was the last person to see Lauren alive and he was in the apartment when Lauren passed away, nobody was pointing any fingers at him, nobody was interrogating him for more info. On December 23rd, 2021, the day before Christmas Eve, that is when Lauren's family had held a memorial for Lauren to celebrate her life, but even though this was, you know, a celebration of her life, there was still so many unanswered questions. And then on December 29th, 2021, the family had went through the holidays with absolutely no answers or help from the police. On December 29th, mind you, all of this had happened on December 13th. This was the first time that the police were entering Lauren's apartment to try to like investigate the area. The family was also telling the police that even if Lauren is dead, they would like to have some of her belongings or look through her apartment. Finally, the police went into the apartment to do a little bit of investigating. On the scene of this, surprisingly, Kevin Cronin was not on the case anymore because Kevin was actually kicked off of the case due to making multiple mistakes in the pursuit of not just Lauren's case, but other cases as well. And once again, the family was not aware of, you know, like Kevin's history with mistreating cases. When the family is let into the apartment, they see all of this very incriminating evidence and they don't want to touch anything because they don't want to, you know, run the risk of getting their fingerprints over someone else's fingerprints. Just by looking at Lauren's bed, they found a used condom, a random pill on the counter, and blood on Lauren's sheets, as well as a plate of food flipped upside down on the living room floor. And this clearly shows that the police were never in Lauren's apartment. They never investigated the apartment because they could easily have used that used condom and sent it in for like testing to figure out who like that semen belonged to. Also could have seen the random pill on the counter and tested that as well. They could have tested the blood on the sheets. For some reason, the police told the family that they couldn't do a search of the apartment until they got a DNA sample from everyone in the family. Just felt more like they were being treated as suspects rather than victims. They felt very, you know, singled out. They felt like it was super unfair that they had to give their DNA to the police while Matthew, the last person to see Lauren alive and then just woke up to seeing Lauren dead beside him. He didn't have to give a DNA sample. He didn't have to give anything. So it seemed like the police just didn't want to do their job. They were trying to like figure out ways to just stall the investigation. But eventually, you know, the family just had to comply and they gave their DNA samples. And once the DNA samples were given, that's when the police finally went into Lauren's apartment in order to investigate the area. And if you guys, you know, watch a lot of true crime or you watch a lot of my channel, you know that like you do not need to give a DNA sample in order for police to investigate an area. Like I think this is the very first time that I've ever done a case where the police has required a DNA sample from the family, like people that weren't even there at the time of the crime. They requested DNA samples from them before, you know, like going into the apartment and investigating the area. I've never heard of that before. Usually police just get a search warrant and they're able to get in there. But for some reason, again, it just seemed like the police were trying every angle to just not do their job and stall the situation. At this time, there was probably just like two or three articles about Lauren's case. Nobody was really talking about it. And it was because this was around the same time of the Gabby Petito case. If you guys don't know, Gabby Petito was a like lifestyle uh, influencer with her boyfriend. They did like van life and a lot of like nature things. All of a sudden Gabby went missing and it created like this huge manhunt on social media trying to find not just Gabby, but also finding her 
her boyfriend that she was last seen with because her boyfriend was also like on the run. It was this huge case and everybody was looking for Gabby, but since Gabby was a white woman, it seemed like people were more favoring her in the media rather than Lauren's case. And I'm not comparing the cases at all. Both cases are extremely troubling. Both cases are extremely traumatizing because at the end of the day, they are still families that lost their daughters and they deserve equal attention when it comes to the media. So I'm not like blaming Gabby or blaming her family for all the media attention that she was getting. It's mostly just the media and the media's representation of these missing persons cases and it's typically favorable of white people rather than people of color and this was extremely prominent as you could see Lauren's case was just as important as Gabby's case yet Gabby's case was getting more attention. Once the family did give their DNA samples to the police that is when they were able to move forward on a investigation and I put investigation in quotes because this this wasn't even really a proper investigation. Basically, Matthew was later on called into questioning to basically just give his timeline of events and what happened that night. Before I start talking about Matthew, because Matthew's lawyer is kind of basically like suing people for, you know, revealing his name, revealing his identity, and also speaking badly about him. So I do want to say that Matthew's attorney said, quote, I think it's the media that's made him the main focus of the investigation. Although Bridgeport police did investigate the matter, he did fully cooperate and he's not the main focus of the investigation anymore. As we know, the DEA is now involved and they will help local authorities investigate the matter and get to the bottom of what happened to Lauren. So I'm not saying he's a killer, but I am saying that he should be further questioned and looked into considering he's the last person to literally really see her alive. I just want to put that out there before explaining Matthew just because I don't want to get sued. Just because I'm saying it may or may not be true doesn't mean we can't put two and two together, you know? He definitely had something to do with Lauren's death because if, you know, Matthew really was this great guy that the police are telling the family, why didn't he contact Lauren's family? You know, even if it was just a first date, if I went on a first date with someone and that person ended up dying wouldn't the first thing you do call the police and contact the family I feel like that whole situation for me personally would be very traumatizing to wake up like to see your date dead and that's definitely something that you would want to help the family out with at least your condolences even if it was just a stranger condolences would be the least you can do but Matthew didn't do anything why is he suing people for defamination and why is he suing people for saying his name when he could easily just say the full story outright and that could be that you know if he really was telling the truth then tell the truth tell the world the truth clear your name anyway going back to the story so Matthew was indeed interrogated and Matthew told police that three days before the date they actually had matched on Bumble they said that the two of them were talking over over the next three days just about everything and he thought Lauren was a very very sweet girl he was very attracted to her and so that is when the two of them decided to meet up in person specifically on the night of December 11th at Lauren's apartment on the night of December 11th Matthew and Lauren did meet up at Lauren's apartment Matthew said that they actually had a great time together they were laughing they were drinking they were playing board games they ate Ate, and then after they ate, they decided to lay down on the couch and watch a movie. He did say, however, that while they were watching the movie, there was a knock at the door. And when Lauren had opened up the door, it was actually Lauren's brother. Matthew said that when her brother showed up, it looked like he was dropping something off, but he really couldn't see what he was dropping off. And then after her brother left, Lauren went into the bathroom for about 10 to 15 minutes before coming back back onto the couch to finish watching the movie. He said that when the movie was over, he looked over to Lauren and he found that she was sleeping. And so that's when he picked her up and brought her to her bed. And you know, for a first date, um, usually if something like this happens, you just kind of leave. You don't really invite yourself in for the night. But 
for some reason, Matthew decided to spend the night. So he laid Lauren on her bed and then he laid down next to her and then just went to sleep. And then when asked if Matthew and her had sex that night, he says that they did not, which again is very odd because where did that used condom come from? And then on top of that, the police weren't even testing the condom to see what kind of DNA was on it. They literally just pretended as if it never existed in the first place. He said that he eventually just fell asleep. He said that he woke up at three in the morning to go pee and then when he did, he heard Lauren snoring. So she was indeed alive at that time. But then a couple hours go by and that's when he woke up again at around 6.30 and then when he woke up, he turned over on his side to look at Lauren and that's when he noticed that there was blood coming out of her nose, which would explain the blood that was found on the sheets. He tried to shake her awake, but unfortunately she wouldn't wake up and so he immediately called the police. On the phone, he said that the dispatcher had instructed him to give chest compressions to Lauren and so that is when he moved Lauren from the bed to the floor to start doing chest compressions. And this actually lines up because when the police got there, they did indeed find Lauren on the floor. However, comma, we don't really know if Matthew was instructed to give chest compressions or not because Matthew's 911 call was never released to the public, which is even more odd because if you are innocent, why wouldn't you release the 911 call? Wouldn't that kind of clear your name at least a little bit? It's believed that in this 911 call, he had to have told the dispatcher that Lauren wasn't breathing and that's why he was doing chest compressions. And so you would think if someone's unresponsive, an ambulance would show up or something, but instead, one detective showed up. That was it, just one detective. No first responders, no police officers, just one detective. And that wasn't the only weird thing about Matthew's story. Matthew also said in his story that the day before, uh, Lauren had asked Matthew for $40 to get her nails done. And this really did not sit well with the family at all because as I was just telling you, Lauren, she is the type of girl that like, she takes care of herself. You know, like she travels the world herself. She makes her own money. She got her own apartment all by herself. She had all these different like businesses. She was in school. Like she's a very independent woman. And so the fact of her asking this guy that she's only known for three days, like asking him for $40, that is just so out of character for Lauren because she doesn't even ask her own mother for money. This gentleman said that they had no sex and he never took his clothes off. Yet still, the police failed to see if, in fact, the statement comports with what was found on the scene. There was also another part in Matthew's story that didn't really add up. As I was just saying earlier, uh, Matthew claims that while him and Lauren were watching a movie, that's when Lauren's brother had showed up and had given something to Lauren, like given something, trying to frame it as like drugs or something super suspicious. But when Lauren's brother was questioned, he said that he was literally just dropping off laundry to Lauren. Like it was not secretive. He even waved to Matthew and Matthew waved back when he got there and so like there was nothing secretive about it there was nothing sneaky it was literally just him dropping off laundry and her brother even said that when he saw Lauren at that time Lauren seemed completely fine she didn't seem intoxicated she didn't seem off like they were talking and she was clearly talking back they even hugged each other goodbye there was also one part of Matthew's story where he claims that Lauren, remember when I said that he said that Lauren went into the bathroom for like 10 to 15 minutes, again, trying to frame it as if she was doing something like bad. He now switched up his story and said that Lauren was in the bathroom for 10 to 15 minutes throwing up because he heard her throwing up. After Matthew was questioned and he was giving all these confusing answers yet nobody was further questioning him, that is when Lauren's family decided to hire an attorney in order to help them out. This attorney was actually helping Lauren's family in suing the police department for not following proper protocols after confirming the body of Lauren. But the police in response to this said, 
said that technically they didn't need to call Lauren's family for confirmation because they already knew Lauren was Lauren by looking at her passport. On January 21st of 2022, the family's lawyer, Darnell Crossland, said that the family intended to sue the Bridgeport Police Department for $30 million for the handling of Lauren's case and they believe that the police department was racially insensitive which led to the mistreatment of Lauren's case and dismissing it as if it didn't happen at all. And the family's attorney actually came out and said, quote, the notice details a number of concerning missteps in the investigation. The fact that obvious evidence was not gathered by police and that officers have been reluctant to formally interview LaFountain or name him as the person of interest. Crossland also alleged that Kevin Cronin, the detective first assigned to the case, has some connection with LaFountain and is currently under investigation by the city's internal affairs department. What I believe is that the police fail to collect and preserve that environment from the first day. The attorney has now filed a notice of claim to sue Bridgeport for negligence, claiming key evidence was not initially submitted to the state lab. The family comes out and says that every single time they went into the station, they just felt like it was all eyes on them. They felt like they were being treated as suspects rather than victims. They felt like nobody was really helping them with anything. And as well as Kevin Cronin, what did Kevin Cronin even do to Lauren's case? Was he he the reason why nobody went into Lauren's apartment? Was he the reason why they had to wait for like a DNA sample in order to investigate the apartment? And also everything that I'm telling you right now, there was probably only two or three articles about Lauren's case. Lauren's case was not getting any media coverage, but it actually wasn't until a very famous rapper by the name of Cardi B took to her Twitter to speak about Lauren's case and this tweet actually led to more and more people like looking into Lauren's story. Cardi B had taken to her Twitter to repost an article that said quote exclusive pictured design engineer 37 whose bumble date 23 died in her blood-stained bed next to him after night of drinking. Her family sues cops for mishandling investigation and not pursuing because he's white. And Cardi B replied to this and said, quote, nah, this man don't look old and it's not old at all. And yet the media made it seem like she was with his old man looking to trick on her. I'm disgusted at how they spin the narrative, especially because I see people saying online, that's what she gets. And this made people extremely, you know, notified of the case, but also extremely frustrated at how the police were handling the case, as well as the media. Like, even that title alone is so frustrating because it literally says Matthew LaFountain 37 design engineer. First of all, who asked? Who asked for his job title? And also calling Lauren just a bumble date? And the article title also says that the family is suing the police department because he's white, which is so, so frustrating because as you just saw, his color of his skin, we did not mention once. The reason why the family was suing the police wasn't because Matthew was white. It was because the police didn't notify Lauren's family when she was dead. They had to find out through Lauren's landlord. The police were hanging up on them when they were just trying to figure out what happened to their daughter. It took them a whole 16 days to get into the apartment and when they went into the apartment, there was clear signs of something happening with blood stains on the sheets, a random pill on the counter. The police wouldn't even do an autopsy on Lauren to try to figure out what happened. They weren't even interviewing Matthew, even though he was the last person to see her alive. 
That is why the family was suing the police department. No matter what color you are, anybody would sue the police department for that kind of mistreatment. And what was supposed to be the police's job of investigating Lauren's apartment, that job just for some reason fell onto the family and the family had to discover the horrific scene of blood on Lauren's sheets, a random pill on her counter, a used con them in her bed like that is the police's job that is something that they should have done 16 days ago and that's why the family was suing the police yet all of these articles that were being posted about Lauren's case just made it sound like Lauren was some random girl that drank too much on a date and ended up dying because of it work with us in some way we haven't heard from them at all it's almost like they're trying to sweep everything under the rug here in our black community we 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 pay taxes you know and they should be working for us and our family and show that they care for us and they're not going to just throw us out like real rubbish every black person every person of color matters and so when that post was made by Cardi B, that same exact day, that is when the family decided to have a march outside of the mayor's office in order to protest changes and actions when it comes to Lauren's case. They also wanted to promote a bill called Lauren's Law. And basically Lauren's Law would enforce the state of Connecticut to contact family of deceased within a 24 hour period of the death of that person. The mayor actually actually came out and made a statement to speak out about the injustices that was made to Lauren, her case, and her family. And the mayor also spoke about what changes that are going to be done within both the police department and in Lauren's case. And then the following day on January 24th of 2022, that is when Lauren's autopsy was released. And it says, quote, on January 24th, Smithfield's autopsy came in from the chief state medical examiner, including that she died of acute intoxication due to her combined effects of fentanyl, promethazine, hydroxine, and alcohol. Her death was ruled as an accident, but because fentanyl was present, the Bridgeport Police Department opened a criminal investigation in the narcotics department with the help of the DEA. Bridgeport's mayor, Joe Ganim, announced that internal affairs will also be investigating the police department's interaction with her family. He also ordered that two police officers be placed on administrative leave. That is Lauren's autopsy. It was ruled as an accident even though fentanyl was present and also ruled as acute intoxication which is insane to me. Acute alcohol intoxication is a clinically harmful condition that usually follows the ingestion of large amounts of alcohol and the key word here is acute because what happened to Lauren was not acute. Lauren died. This was lethal intoxication. There was nothing acute about this situation. And all of these drugs that were found in her body was extremely concerning because as I said, Lauren was an extremely healthy person. She kept to a plant-based diet. She worked out on the regular. She really took care of herself and her body. So her combining this insane amount of drugs was so unlike her and just taking drugs in general was so unlike her. Even if you are like with a stranger and that stranger is taking the drugs, as I said, Lauren was smart. She was responsible and she definitely wasn't the type of person to be easily peer pressured into something that she didn't want to do. And also if she was taking these combo of drugs regularly, you would definitely see it in the autopsy that she has long lasting effects of, you know, drugs tearing up her body. But no, she was completely healthy. A forensic expert by the name of Joseph Morgan, who was also an expert correspondent for the George Floyd trial, said that he believes Lauren did not have the time to develop a dependency on these drugs to take so much and accidentally kill herself. Even the family's attorney himself, Darnell, he even said himself that he has 
never seen a medical examiner rule this wild mix of drugs as an accident with no evidence of prior use of drugs. People were even more angry than they were before ruling her death as acute when it was not acute whatsoever. And so because of this, the mayor came out with another statement where he was expressing his condolences to the family and their loss. He is also extremely disappointed in the leadership and the treatment of the victims in the situation. He was also saying that the Bridgeport Police Station on behalf of them is also extremely disappointed and sorry. He said that due to this, further action will be taken and two officers were put on administrative leave, including Kevin Cronin. He also said that he himself will be working closely with the department to make the necessary changes they will need. Also enforcing protocols to confirm to the families when they have found someone dead, saying, quote, there is no tolerance for anything less than respect and sensitivity for family members and their loss. When the autopsy was released, the family wasn't really having it, and so they actually requested for an independent autopsy. And it's not like Lauren was, you know, at a party or a club where she could have gotten, like, roofied or something by someone. She was in the comfort of her own home. And so at this point in the investigation, when the autopsy was released and everybody was talking about it, people did a little bit of digging online, and they were able to find Matthew LaFountain, his his name and his face and so all of that was released to the public and due to his name and face being publicly out there now Lauren's family attorney also came out and said quote we will not stop until we get justice for Lauren and the thousands of black girls that go missing in this country every year we owe them equal rights and justice regardless of race and we wouldn't stop fighting until we get it and not only were people online trying to help and aid in the investigation even Bumble the app came out and gave their condolences about Lauren's family. They also said that they would comply with the police and offer the police any sort of like private chats or private messages that they needed. They also offered them both of, you know, Lauren and Matthew's dating accounts to try to investigate, you know, is this something that Matthew has done before? Does he usually prey on women? Literally, why is Bumble doing more work than the police right now. Like, that is terrifying. And with the uproar of this case, there were also a lot of people all over TikTok who were trying to spread the word of the case. On March 3rd of 2022, that is when the Bridgeport lawmakers proposed a bill in response to Lauren's case, as well as another woman by the name of Brenda Lee Rawls, who also went missing on the same day as Lauren. As far as the aftermath of all of this, the the most recent update we have is January 30th of 2023, but unfortunately the case is still just being looked at. The bill was in for approval and it's still undergoing approval, but hasn't, you know, finalized anything yet. It's now been a little over a year since the death of Lauren and the family held a balloon release on January 22nd, the day before what would have been her 25th birthday with her mother saying, quote, I'm doing this today because it's been an entire year that my daughter has been gone and I just want to celebrate her birthday and I want the families of Bridgeport to celebrate with me, the mothers that lost their kids to celebrate with our family. I don't want anyone to forget about my daughter. There has been no official reports released about the ongoing actions of Lauren's case. Police are still not really looking into Matthew as much. They still don't see him as a suspect. Police did in fact open up a criminal investigation on the case, but as of today, the case is still open and active. The official autopsy report was never released to the public, only a statement of what was was on the report or just from what I could find. The 911 call that Matthew had made to the police still to this day has also not been released to confirm if the dispatcher actually told Matthew to pick Lauren up and lay her on the floor and do chest compressions. We also don't know Matthew's demeanor during this phone call, what exactly he was calling for because again, only one detective showed up and when this detective showed up, that's when an actual first responder came and then 
and that's when she was declared dead at 6.59 a.m. The family to this day still fights for the justice of Lauren and for her case to be looked at further. And it also seems like the police were helping Matthew by calling him like a good guy or we don't need to look into him. He's a great person when in fact you're not a great person. Like if someone dies in front of you and you're not even giving your condolences to the family, that's not a nice person thing to do. Anyone that genuinely cared and they were there, the last person there and they know that nothing bad happened, you would at least even reach out to the family yourself. Like, exactly. listen, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss of your daughter or your sister. They're still fighting for Lauren's case, but you do just get to a point where you have to accept and heal from the situation because although amidst all the craziness, at the end of the day, they did lose their daughter. And on top of losing their daughter, they also have to go through the stresses of this insane, elongated, like unreasonably elongated, uh, investigation about the case. Hopefully justice will be served to Lauren one day, but as of now, you know, the family is just trying to heal from everything that's been going on. They're trying their best to ensure that people don't forget Lauren and don't forget Lauren's story. But yeah, that is the end of today's video. If you guys found this video interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And if you want to follow me on any of my socials, like my Instagram, that will be linked down below, as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything and as well as well all of the research that I use for this video so all of the articles that I mention all of the organizations all of the interviews all of that will be linked down below so if you want to go ahead and do your own research about the case you definitely can and if you do go ahead and do your own research about the case and you find something that I did not find in my research or that I simply did not say make sure to leave that in the comments below because I'm pretty sure everyone here will be interested to hear what you have to say. And as well, as well, as well, all of the makeup that I put on my face. So if you're wondering what the foundation was, what the lip is, what the eyebrows are, all of that will be linked down below. Make sure to go outside today, get some fresh air, enjoy the sun, get your vitamin D. And even if it's raining where you're at, then enjoy the rain, enjoy the soothing comfort of the rain. I hope you guys overall have a wonderful rest of your day. Make sure to be safe out there. Again, as always, I love you, I love you, I love you, and do something that makes you happy today.